Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I could never really um, predict anything. Uh, the best laid plans of mice and men. Whether we, we, we'll move on to a conversation about Brexit, I imagine, imminently. But um, before that, the breaking news. Regarding Julian Assange, there, there were whispers earlier in the week that, that something was afoot. Um, they were largely denied by the authorities, but it, but it appears that they were um, founded on good intelligence. Um, if you're just joining us, Julian Assange has been arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy. The founder of the uh, website WikiLeaks uh, has been arrested after seven years inside that building. It follows the withdrawal of diplomatic asylum. The Ecuadorian government, for reasons as yet undisclosed, have elected this week to withdraw that, um, that offer of asylum. At the time uh, that he took refuge in the embassy, Assange claimed that if he was extradited to Sweden to face sexual assault allegations, he might be arrested by the US and face charges relating to WikiLeaks' publication of hundreds of thousands of US diplomatic cables. It is worth noting, I suppose, at this point, that the political landscape in America has changed beyond all recognition since Julian Assange took refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy. So I'm certainly not confident enough to make any comment or, or, or claim with regard to whether or not that fear, if it was justified at the time, would remain justified today. His internet access was cut off in March, an indication that the relationship between Assange and his hosts was souring somewhat. He was also forbidden from having visitors. Um, he definitely had visitors prior to that. I just can't quite remember who. I, I some of it got quite widely reported at the time, but we will keep a close eye on that story and, and find hopefully a little more um, expert analysis of it for you momentarily. Um, before that, back to Brexit. The scenario has changed uh, slightly in that the uh, postponement of reality has been agreed by the EU27, with France apparently keen to deny us. So that would be, I think, and again, it's really important at the moment to acknowledge uncertainty over what happens because it is now down to human beings making decisions. It is not down to words on paper, things that are written down. All of it was comprehensible, even predictable, if you properly understood what you were reading and seeing. But, but now, I mean, Macron and Merkel disagreed, apparently, over the length of the extension, which suggests to me that Emmanuel Macron was um, not very frightened about that no deal we were supposed to leave on the table as leverage. As we asked for a delay, I would <laughs> postpone falling out with no deal, crashing out with no deal. And Emmanuel Macron was, was, was keen not just to shorten the delay that, that the rest of the EU27 were prepared to deliver, but um, uh, reportedly even contemplating saying no altogether on the grounds that, that we made this mess and it's time we stopped asking them to help get us out of it. That, that of all the things you have to pick as so demonstrably daft at the time you can't quite believe that it ever got inflated it would probably be that argument about no deal being better than a bad deal or we have to leave it on the table to threaten them the, the, the phrase that i think i stole off one of my um uh, correspondence on social media was that it is like punching somebody with your own testicles that that was the threat that we were making essentially when we said oh well if you don't do what we want we'll leave we'll, we'll, we'll crash out with no deal uh, i've put together or i haven't put it together i've i've um uh, magpied one of those cool little collages of commentary from before the referendum when key players on the leaf side were describing in i'm afraid explicit terms the absolute impossibility of a no deal so persuaded were there that things would be easy that french vintners and, and uh german car manufacturers would be bending over backwards to uh, to accommodate our desires that we held all the cards all of that it's, it's, it's always timely i think to remind you of other people's words rather than necessarily to bombard you with mine um although i reserve the right to indulge in the occasional bombardment. On, on the question of Brexit, I, I listened to, to Nick yesterday discussing his um, apparent boredom with the whole issue. Uh, his name then became added to that growing list of people who, who once agitated to leave, but who now recognise that the interests of the nation would probably be best served by Remain. It's important to create a, a, a warm and welcoming space for these people, as we've discussed many, many times on this programme. I, I struggle a little bit 
uh, particularly with prominent people in my profession, like, like, like Peter Oborn and others, although their admission that they got it wrong is very healthy. Um, I, I, I do find it a little bit... I don't know. But, but it's a discomfort that, that is negligible in the greater scheme of things. Even if you want to pretend that you aren't now accepting that you got it wrong and you're not yet prepared to stand up in public and say, I made a terrible mistake, I, I misunderstood, my analysis was incorrect, which is what Peter Oborn did, if you want to instead just say, oh, can't we just all make it go away, without taking any responsibility for encouraging other people to vote for something that was clearly, clearly silly, that's fine too. I, I, I don't think you can start splitting hairs and... Um, it's a sort of form of political pedantry, isn't it? And I don't think it, it serves anybody. But you do still have that weird argument that things, A, could have gone any differently and B, still could go differently. David Davis doing the rounds this morning. I, I mean, actually breathtaking. It was funny when we first put together, or when Charlie Higson first helped us do Swiss David Davis, when we first got the... Um, uh, the character of David Davis off off to a T after realising that he is basically Swiss Tony out of the Fast Show. Uh, that's not funny anymore because he's still doing it. How wrong does David Davis have to be about everything before my industry stops turning to him as a as a good faith actor, as someone whose opinion or whose thoughts are worth listening to? Still inflating the Malthouse compromise. That that is. The, the, the document that says we've got a solution to the problem in Ireland, uh, but we can't tell you what it is yet. Uh, the European Union are, are I mean, they're, they're not even rolling their eyes at this anymore. They're, they're just utterly, utterly baffled as to how key players in British politics can still be saying something that they have explained, not just rejected, but explained exhaustively why it's never going to happen. We're never going to let you tell us that you've got a solution to this massive problem, but you can't tell us what it is yet. It's incredible, but there's David Davis doing it again, going utterly unchallenged by John Humphreys on, uh, on Radio 4 this morning. It's quite incredible. And John Humphreys did something else with Ken Clark that I thought was really interesting and really relevant to the unfolding chaos. Is he said, well, some people might say that you're part of a, of a Remain conspiracy or some other hogwash. That's why we're in this mess, because prominent BBC journalists take demonstrable daftness and offer it up as a form of false equivalence with things that are observably true. Some people might say the moon is made of cheese. Could you imagine if Neil Armstrong was being interviewed by John Humphreys after coming back from the moon? And John Humphreys said, well, some people might say that the whole thing was filmed in a hangar in Stoke... Newington, or some people might say the moon is actually made of cheese, so you couldn't possibly have landed. Or some people might say that the world is made of lizards, run by lizards, secret lizards, armies of lizards. It just wouldn't happen. So why do we allow David Davis to do the Brexit equivalent of telling us that the moon is made of cheese or that the planet is secretly run by lizards, while the flagship news programmes of the nation leave it unchallenged. We're never, ever, ever going to start backing out of this mess until we start <laughs> ignoring the people who led us into it. It's so blindingly obvious. Isn't it? Do you remember when you got lost as a kid? Because in the days before SatNav and, and, and Google Maps and stuff on your phone and built into your dashboard. And usually, usually it would involve the navigator not being very good and therefore somebody else taking over. So the person that has navigated Britain into this crushing international humiliation. David Davis, the first Secretary of State for leaving the European Union. Boris Johnson, the Foreign Secretary in Theresa May's first cabinet. The people who have negotiated and navigated the country into this almighty mess are still at the top of the call list for programme producers. Friends and colleagues of mine, make no mistake, I, I, I'm aware of the relative discomfort that I might be engaging in, but somebody's got to do it. You, you should not be talking to these people anymore. They have lost the faith of the country. And the poor souls who are still believing their nonsense about no deal being anything other than catastrophic or about, oh, it all could have gone differently if only we'd put somebody else in charge of delivering the unicorns, then we'd all have our unicorns by now. That's a national tragedy. It's a, it's a national disgrace that these poor souls are still being fed unicornist, cakeist nonsense by the likes of Davis... And, of course, Johnson, who's, who's still got his eye on 10 Downing Street. It's, it's quite incredible to speak to somebody from somewhere else to get an indication, an inkling of how we now look. It's quite incredible. And yet still it continues. Still it continues. Jacob rees well, I will never abandon the DUP. 24 hours later, oh, sorry, DUP, it's a touch of the old abandoning that you're getting today. 
Uh, this is slavery, it's vassalage. I'm, I'm going to vote for it, actually. I, 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 in any other line of work, if you were to undertake such an astonishing exercise in simple wrongness, let's not even bring personal morality or integrity into it, just wrongness, you know? If I turned up at work and spoke into the wrong end of the microphone for an hour so that you couldn't actually hear me, and then the boss stuck his head around the door and said, could you talk into the right end of the microphone, do you think? We're just getting weird crackling white noise out of the speakers in the office. And I said, no, 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 no. Just have a little faith. I believe that if I speak into the wrong end of the microphone, then eventually my message will reach the ears of my listeners with greater clarity and beauty than it ever could if I were to speak in the right end of the microphone. Do you think they'd let me sit here for the next two or three years, however long they've handcuffed me for? Do you think they'd let me sit here and speak into the wrong end of the microphone or to just speak in a language that I'd made up myself? If I, if I came on air tomorrow morning and just went, wibble, wibble, grick, 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 wibble, wibble, grr, wibble. Wibble, wibble. How long would they leave me here for, do you think? Jacob Rees Walk and David Davis can tour the studios of this country saying, essentially, in a slightly different accent, wibble, wibble, grr, where, grr, wibble. And it doesn't ever get called out. So, although you could construe the latest delay, the latest postponement as somehow good news for Remainers, I mean, it's bad news for everybody. The things that we can all agree on, however, will remain elusive until we can all agree that the people who led us into this mess should be quiet now and sit down. How, how do we get out of this hole? My suggestion is we stop listening to the people who got us into it. But of course, the people who got us into it are claiming it's not their fault it's all gone horribly wrong. It's the fault of the people who understood that it was going to go horribly wrong. How would you get us out of this hole? 0345 973 And we are speaking for the avoidance of any doubt about Brexit. Um, I, I, I genuinely reached a new level of befuddlement this morning listening to David Davis. Uh, it's still inflating balloons of utter balminess and still going largely unchallenged. I, I do genuinely think that there is no way out of this hole until we stop listening to the people who got us into it. And they're never going to be quiet. So people in my profession have to start ignoring them. You don't get to comment on this if you've been wrong about everything up until this point. And, and Parliament is full of people who are just wrong. It, it's not a value judgment, I'm afraid. It's a binary. It's, it, it's just not true, some of the stuff they apparently believe to be true. And poor old Bill Cash, who you know I hold in the highest regard. I've known him since I was 13 years old. Reduced to describing us being humiliated and somehow trying to pin it on something other than our ludicrous, self-inflicted decision to undertake Brexit. Culminating yesterday in the Prime Minister of France being the sole arbiter of what happens to our country next. Quite incredible. Quite incredible. <laughs> Events closer to home in London, of course, concern us this morning, where the founder of WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, has been arrested at the Ecuadorian embassy. The journalist Joshua Rosenberg is, is probably the doyen of legal journalists in this country and has followed the story more closely than most. Um, did we know this was going to happen, Joshua, and what does it mean? We certainly didn't know that this was going to happen, although it was quite clear that the mood in Ecuador was changing and Julian Assange's supporters thought that the present government in Ecuador was going to withdraw his political asylum. That seems to be uh, what's happened because the Metropolitan Police were invited into the embassy in London this morning by the ambassador. Uh, the police said that the Ecuador government had indeed withdrawn Julian Assange's mm. asylum. He was arrested and uh, he will be taken to a magistrate's court, Westminster Magistrate's Court in London, uh, and accused of failing to surrender to his bail. That's the only charge he faces. He was, of course, on bail when he went into the Ecuadorian embassy uh, near Harrods in Knightsbridge uh, seven years ago nearly. Uh, and uh, that's the offence he is charged with uh, in this country at the moment. And the allegations he faced... I'm just seeing footage of him being carried out, actually. He's, he, yes. he doesn't look very happy about it. And, no, um, he doesn't look he, happy and doesn't look very well. No, but he does have the look of a, of a man who, well, I suppose has been incarcerated in a, in a small room for seven years. Um, quite, quite. Uh, the, the, the allegations he faced, have they expired? 
Uh, some of the allegations that he faced in Sweden have yes. indeed expired. Some have not. But um, that's um, not perhaps um, really um, the point. Um, the point is um, that he is facing um, uh, charges in this country. Yes. Um, of skipping bail, to use layman's language. Bail. Yes. Exactly so. Exactly so. And of course, his concern is not so much Sweden, uh, because if he had accepted his extradition to Sweden over the sexual assault charges, uh, then whatever happened, he would have been uh, free now. His concern is he has reason to believe that the United States is seeking his extradition, mm. and that if he is extradited to the United States and convicted there, uh, he will be sentenced to a long prison term. It's worth making very, very clear uh, to those of his supporters who imagine that he faces the death penalty in the United States that this country, the United Kingdom, never extradites people to a country where they will face the death penalty. In other words, uh, the Americans, if they seek his extradition and they haven't confirmed this, would have to confirm that he would not face the death penalty if he were convicted in the United States. I see. And is there any mileage in the observation that the regime in the White House is profoundly different from the regime that was in place when Assange sought refuge in the Ecuadorian embassy? One could go so far as to say that Donald Trump's relationship or opinion of um, the dumping of classified information in, in the public space is rather more nuanced than Barack Obama's. Uh, that may be true, um, but uh, certainly Assange's supporters aren't relying on that. They're much more concerned about the fact that the mood in Ecuador seems to have changed, yes. and presumably Ecuador um, will know that this move by Ecuador will, will be welcomed uh, by President Trump and the United States administration. And, and finally, Joshua Rosenberg, I appreciate that the, the um, experts like yourself don't like questions like this, but what, what, what would be a feasible sentence if he were to be convicted of, of the bail charge? <laughs> Uh, the maximum is 12 months, okay. uh, and that's only in the Crown Court. The Magistrates Court, where he's expected to appear later today, uh, wouldn't be able to impose uh, quite uh, such a long sentence. Um, and uh, it may well depend on uh, whether he admits jumping bail. Uh, there was a case of a man in court today, Jack Shepard, uh, mm. a speedboat killer, who admitted jumping bail about half an hour ago and got a third off his sentence and a little bit more and ended up with six months. Uh, but uh, um, the Magistrates maximum is 12 months uh, on a plea of not guilty, which is unlikely because, um, you know, it's pretty clear that he didn't turn up when he was ordered to seven years ago. Indeed, and the government have said that Assange will face justice in the UK. Joshua Rosenberg, many thanks indeed for your time and your insights. Rachel Venables is on the ground outside the Ecuadorian embassy. She joins me live on LBC. Rachel, what's going on? Well, the circus is arriving and I think setting up camp is one way of putting it. I mean, when we heard the news just in the last hour or so from the Metropolitan Police that Julian Assange had been arrested here inside the Ecuadorian embassy, journalists like myself jumped up and ran here down to Knightsbridge at the embassy itself, just uh, behind Harrods here. And I'm currently stood just outside the balcony, so below the balcony where in the past anyone who may have seen photos of Julian Assange speaking to his supporters, speaking to the press um, will know that's where he appeared from with the Ecuadorian flag fluttering. And it was in this building, as I say, where the police, the Metropolitan Police, after staging um, a watch almost on this building now for nearly seven years, were finally invited inside. And that's the crucial thing here, because, of course, we know Julian Assange has been seeking asylum here for so many years. And in the end, it was his hosts, his landlords, his protectors who effectively allowed in the police, who then led him away. And footage has appeared online showing... Um, a, a, a haggard almost looking Julian yes. Assange, white hair, white beard. He's, he's sort of gesturing oh, with he his arms. He always had white hair, but the beard's very yes. long. The beard's very long. It's it's fully shocking white almost. And you can just tell he, he looks like a man who hasn't really seen much sunlight in, in seven years. And he's being led into a police van. And we understand he is now in custody in a central London police station. We don't know which one. And we do know that he is expected to appear at Westminster Magistrates Court, as far as the police are concerned, as soon as possible to answer to those seven-year-long charges of, of skipping bail. Like a skinny, grizzly Adams for listeners of a certain age. Um, Rachel, do we know, because uh, the wiki Leaks Twitter account, of course, remains a, a focus of some interest. Do, do we know how much influence he has had over that during his incarceration? There have been times when it seems he was tweeting it single-handedly, times when it seemed it was being run by people on the other side of the world. 
Well, certainly his um, access to things like the internet, access to things like WikiLeaks is actually uh, something that has it, it is part of the picture of his relationships with his hosts because it is the Ecuadorian president, President Moreno, who's accused him and WikiLeaks of hacking himself, the president. And so recently, in recent months, he actually uh, took away Assange's right access to the internet, eventually even restricting his access to visitors, restricting um, even his access to a telephone. We heard at a press conference that was organized by WikiLeaks yesterday. So certainly in anything you may have seen more recently, that is coming just from his, his friends, his supporters at WikiLeaks, not from Assange himself. And of course, one of the key denials that he's, that he's been giving is, well, how can I have been involved in hacking the Ecuadorian president, releasing photos of his family, for example, to the press, uh, allegations of uh, illicit dealings, you might say, um, when I haven't had any access to the internet here. But certainly that relationship, sure. that, you know, that, that really horrible relationship sort of disintegrating, as it were, is, is why, really, we should assume eventually they, they withdrew the right to asylum and they invited the police inside here this morning. Roger Venables, more from you if and when the story develops. I, I, just looking at the Twitter feed, thanks to my friend I'm Incorrigible, who is astonishingly um, uh, capable at times like this, of the president, uh, Presidente Constitucional de la República del Ecuador, which I think means the president of Ecuador. You know, his first name's Lenin. Uh, make of that what you will. Anyway, he appears to have said, Mr. Assange violated repeatedly clear-cut provisions of the conventions on diplomatic asylum. He particularly violated the norm of not intervening in the internal affairs of other states. He installed electronic and distortion equipment not allowed. He blocked the security cameras of the Ecuadorian mission in London. He had access to the security files of our embassy without permission. And this is crucial given what Joshua Rosenberg just reminded us of regarding extradition and death penalties. I requested Great Britain to guarantee that Mr. Assange would not be extradited to a country where he could face torture or the death penalty. The British government has confirmed it in writing. Um, I get my slightly... I get my mad mullahs or jihadists mixed up, but that was also the reason why we, despite what Theresa May and right-wing newspapers might have told you at the time, one of the reasons why we couldn't extradite... I forget which one it was, the one that was born in Bethlehem, to, to a country where he'd be put on trial for terrorist offences was because that country had a history of undertaking torture and then that's that's what the Human Rights Act extended to. As soon as they give a categorical pledge, a written promise not to use torture, then we're free to extradite. Um, I'm just trying to remember because I didn't realise he'd been banned from, from taking visitors at the embassy. I'm trying to remember who, who got photographed visiting him at the Ecuadorian embassy. It was a bloke who he also campaigned for that American politician Roy Moore, who, who, who was accused of paedophilia and uh, molestation and, and really vile crimes while he was running to be um, uh, the, the, that senator for Alabama, an English bloke. He got photographed coming out of the Ecuadorian embassy. He campaigned for um, Roy Moore, who, who, of course, faced allegations from nine women of sexual misconduct, child molestation and paedophilia. And he's always bigging up Donald Trump, who boasts about grabbing women by the genitals and has several outstanding allegations against him. What's the fella's name? Funny looking bloke. Dyes his hair. Grey skin. It's gone. I, I suppose, again, I'm in that difficult position this morning of, of wanting to talk to you when you're probably not that likely to ring me. Because um, if you... I, I just wondered how wrong David Davis would have to be about everything before you started listening to him. Uh, stopped listening to him. Before you stopped thinking that he was a... A valid voice now in this debate. It, it, I, and I'm focusing on David Davis because he was Secretary of State for leaving the European Union. He was photographed with nothing on the table in front of him as Michel Barnier sat there with pages of files and, and um, facts in front of him. And when asked about it, Davis tapped his temple. You think I'm making this up? Who, he said, who are you going to trust more? The guy with all the paperwork in front of him or the guy who's got it all up here? And he tapped his temple. I could not believe my ears this morning when... Uh, Alistair Campbell actually tweeted um, amusingly, and I appreciate Alistair is a controversial and, and divisive character, but he, he, he understands the workings of government and arguably the relationship between politics and media better than almost anybody else. And, and he tweeted light-heartedly about who was going to get the, 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 the 10 past 8 slot on Radio 4's Today programme this morning. Well, will it be in Duncan Smith or David Davis or something like that? It was a joke. And then up he popped. Utterly, utterly discredited. In, in, just in the context of observable evidence. Nothing about his personality or anything like that. Not today, although 
I reserve the right to return to such territory in the very, very imminent future. I just, I, 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 if you voted leave and David Davis is one of the people who persuaded you to do so, actually no one even admits that in public anymore, do they? In public, people voted leave precisely because they knew the Remain campaign were right. Have you seen this yet? You're probably not as exposed to it as I am. This is the latest chapter in the, in the madness. So you, 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 you get a leave person on social media responding to a suggestion that they didn't know what they were voting for or that they were lied to. And they respond by saying, no, we knew exactly what was going on. Here's David Cameron telling us. And you sort of go, I've seen some contortions in my time. But really? You've, you've let them reduce you to this? The people who you believed have betrayed you so completely that you're now claiming that the people you actually believed were the ones that you voted against. I, I, I don't get that on any level except pride, I suppose, and, and self-preservation. And of course there's always that difficulty of knowing who's real and who is um, a, a bad faith actor, whether they're just in it for, for, for clicks and giggles or whether they're trolling for more sinister reasons or whether they're part of a sort of paid army of disruptors. But the bottom line is that David Davis has been proven categorically wrong about everything since he started campaigning to leave the European Union, and yet today still, and there is, there is criticism isn't quite the right word, there's questioning here, of course there is, of people that I, I love and respect and, and work alongside, but I just want you to tell me how bad it would have to be before he got excluded from future contributions to these conversations. Because today he's still talking gibberish about the solution to the problem of the British border in Ireland that, that we've got. We've called it alternative arrangements. We just can't tell you what it is yet. It, it's incredible to me now that as these constant confirmations of reality continue, March the 29th, not a chance. What are you reduced to now? No deal. You're shilling for no deal. I, 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 is Andrew Bridgen still talking about Article 24 of, of GATT? I mean, this stuff has been demonstrably demolished. It's been completely dismantled. Emmanuel Macron last night was reportedly agitating to push us over the cliff sooner rather than later, and yet people like David Davis still claim they're going to reopen the withdrawal agreement weeks after we're supposed to have left. Right up until the date on which we were supposed to leave, they explained and insisted ad infinitum, we're not going to reopen it. We've got 27 governments to agree to it. You can't get one. Oh, well, I'm David Davis. I'm the only one who understands this stuff. Everybody else is just wallowing around in my wake. And still, he gets a seat in the studio. I, d I don't get it anymore. I know how hard it is if you've got a programme to fill. And he's prominent. He's a big now. God, we can't get Fr Francois. We could get David Davis today. And in a way, I understand why you'd book a Bridgin or a Francois for comedy value. But David Davis is treated like a serious player. He's a joke. He is a national, I tell a lie, he is an international joke. He's an interplanetary joke. And yet this weird Brexit bubble that Britain continues to inhabit still treats him like a serious player. And I, I don't know what I'm even asking you today. I think I'm just asking you why. Who, 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 okay, let's do it like this. If I promise not to bite your head off... Just give me a ring and tell me if you still think David Davis is worth listening to, OK? I reserve the right to ask you a couple of questions, but just give me a ring and, and tell me why you think he should still be listened to. And, and I'm gonna, I think I'm going to exclude one answer to that, which is this idea that simply by changing the personnel in Downing Street, things could cut, somehow have gone differently. It's not good enough to say somebody else could have done a better job, but I can't tell you how. I can tell you who should have been the J-Dog, should have been Double D, should have been uh, Bozza. You can do that, but I can't let that pass without you telling me how. What would they have done differently so that things could have ended differently? Because I, I look back fondly on the time when we really thought this guy knew what he was doing. Hello, David Davis here. You know, James, negotiating with the EU is very much like making love to a beautiful woman. Nobody ever pretended that it would be easy. I've always said that it'll be tough, complex, and at times confrontational, just how I like it. You see, the EU, like any lady, likes playing hard to get. 
She won't accept everything we ask for, of course. They never do. But she does have a track record of coming to the table in the waning hours and rolling over. So we need to go in and go in hard, get what we want and get out quick. And finally, let me promise you what I promise all the ladies. Withdrawal will be quick and easy and not at all messy. Ugh, honestly. I remember, that was funny. Um, 11.25, mystery hour at 12, we better crack on. Patrick's in Foon in Denmark. Patrick, what's the latest from Denmark? Oh, it's cold today. Uh, you'll be getting a good weather back for the weekend, so that's all that matters, really. Glad to hear it. So, I believe that we should reset and restart the process. I know this won't be popular with many of your listeners, but after three years of squabbles, another six months of squabbles will at best, in my opinion, probably upset 75% of the country. No, nothing's going to carry. I mean, unless she somehow gets Jeremy Corbyn to, to, to grease the passage of her withdrawal agreement through Parliament with a customs union Thank attached. You. But but uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm interested really today in, in the key players. Am I being unkind, unfair to David Davis? Or is, is, is do you understand as a punter, it's a word we use, uh, do you understand as a punter why he is still treated as a, as a valid voice in these conversations, despite having been wrong about everything up until this point? I actually saw that temple tapping uh, video. It was uh, quite amusing. And um, it, it, it did actually look like a second-hand car salesman, so probably using Swiss Tony as, a, as his character is probably the right thing to have done. I actually have a process. I, I believe that if we restart the process, revoke Article 50... Uh, we then estimate a date for a people's vote, and then a cross-party team then work on everything. UK citizens' rights, future trade, EU law, courts, uh, standards. Uh, so we get a clear like picture of what is... Plot. Well, I, think, I mean, in many ways, the withdrawal agreement has already done that, although you're right, it leaves some questions unanswered, so that then you have a clear picture of the plausible. The plausible, but also that the risks involved, which will be put in engineering, a, co a cause and effect, a spec timetable will be in place, and then we do the same thing for Remain. Yeah, but what do you know what the problem is? For, I, mean, I might be slightly um, uh, punch drunk personally, but the problem will be that it doesn't matter. You write it down, it looks very unattractive. Someone like Davis or Johnson pops up and claims that there is one that isn't written down. There is an as yet unspecified Brexit. There is alternative arrangements in Ireland. And that's the best one. It just goes to a different school. And until we close them out of this conversation, I think a significant number of decent people who, who, who trust politicians in the public eye to at least be in some sort of relationship with reality will continue to believe that there is, there is just, just over the horizon, there's a, there's a, you know, a unicorn farm. I don't think the unicorn farm exists and, and... Well, of course it doesn't exist, but they think it does because people like David Davis keep telling them, well, if only I was in charge, things would be going brilliantly. But, I mean, if, if things were equal, if, if at the end of the process we did um, end up with no deal and we did end up with um, World Trade Organisation rules, um, probably 15 years later, we will probably be more or less where we are now. Could you be lucky. But then got, yeah, <laughs> Maybe. Um, anyway, I, I hear you, Patrick. The phone line's not great. Wayne in Basildon is complaining, which means that I have to uh, move along. I worry about his little ears. Charles is in Walthamstow. Charles, what's going on? Hello. Hello. So, yeah, what I want to say is this. Um, the Brexiteers are not ever... You're not allowed to use that word on this oh, programme. That's the, all right, carry the on. Leave, the people advocate leave yes. are not ever sufficiently challenged when they lie. And we should call them... You know, we should use the word liar when they lie, and there's a particular lie they continue to tell, and they're not really challenged on, which is this, that they say Brexit is the will of the people. Oh, I know. The people voted to leave the EU. Um, the public voted. And it is simply a lie. 52% of those who voted is not the public. That is not the people. It's not the will of the people. And one further thing on that, when you challenge them about it and, and then they say, oh, but that's how democracy works. Mm. That is another lie. That is not how democracy works. Not even in this country, let alone in other parts of the world, but not in Scotland, not in Northern Ireland, not in Wales, <clears throat> not in... It, well, it's the, the, the will of which nations. people? It's, it's the will of which people, isn't it? It's, it's the will of... Uh, people like David Davis talk about the will of the people without adding the bit in brackets. It's the yeah, will no, of the they, people who believe the nonsense I was spouting three years ago and still believe me now. They, they, I don't even know if they exist. 
And well, that, this is the thing, and that's an, and another thing about David Davis is that people say, you know, if we had somebody like David Davis in charge, he was in charge. I know. What's the matter with people? Have, have they forgotten? He was the one who was doing it all. I mean... What is wrong with them? I, well, it's, that's what I, I don't know. I, I would genuinely, and I promise not to bite anybody's head off, I genuinely would like to speak to someone who thinks, I'd really like to know what David Davis has to say about all this. Can, I, can you do something for me in the future? Well, I don't know. <laughs> when, they, when they lie, you yeah. know when uh, the voice that um, John Burko uses when he said it calls, Division! Yes. Oh, I don't want to say too loud. We should use... <laughs> Liar! Exactly, thank you. That's what you should remember that bloke back back in the good old days before everything went down the toilet. There used to be a bloke hanging around on Parliament Green. Whenever Sheila Fogarty was doing an outside broadcast, he'd be in the background going, Oh, politicians are liars! Which was a little <laughs> extreme, but we just should pick on the ones that are. And, and again, I don't know whether I've got this right or wrong. I find myself stepping back from words like liar and... Well, no, not from words like liar, actually. So some of them now must deserve to be called liars, but that, that somehow portrays the people who believe them as gullible, and, and I don't like that. Even that makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. I, I, I will let you go unchallenged if, in good faith, you find yourself waking up in the morning now and thinking, I'll tell you who I'd really like to hear from today. David Davis. And we should put together the greatest hits, shouldn't we, actually? Remind ourselves of all the things he said off the top of my head. It'll be the row of the summer, he said, about sequencing of, of the negotiations with the European Union. He, he rolled over and did exactly what the European Union wanted shortly before the end of the first lunch of that day. We'll hold all the cards. Um, I'm led by donkeys would have done some great work on this. I'm just wondering at what point the public status of, of somebody like David Davis, and, and I'm picking on him today only because he was the one doing the rounds of the studios after the latest humiliation on the world stage caused entirely by him and his co-conspirators. Um, I'm just wondering if there is ever a point at which we would all agree, in a sense, that um, he, he's lost the right to, to engage. Let's run through them. There will be no downside to Brexit, only a considerable upside okay that's that's on the record there will be no downside to brexit only a couple only a considerable up, upside and what i'm examining now is the notion that we sit here in our profession in my profession and we go i tell you who i want to hear from today the guy who said there'd be no downside to brexit only a considerable upside he'd be really worth listening to um it, it, it just kind of Beggar's belief. He said we'll get a very, very large trade area, much bigger than the European Union, probably ten times the size. Where did he get that from? If it was ten times the size of the European Union, the trade area he describes would be one and a half times bigger than the planet. This was pointed out by the MEP, Catherine Bearder. Um, within two years before the negotiation with the EU is likely to be complete and therefore anything material has changed, we can negotiate a free trade area massively larger than the EU. No, you can't. No trade deals were ready by March the 29th, 2019. They are, of course, highly complex. On average, it takes seven years to negotiate one um, with India, five with Australia. February this year, even Liam Fox said that the new trade deals could be some time away. So there will be no downside, only a considerable upside. Okay. We'll get a very, very large trade area, probably ten times the size of the EU, which would make it one and a half times the size of the entire planet. Two years, we can negotiate a free trade area massively larger than the EU. We simply can't. Um, it, there will be no downside. I can't even examine that one. We've fallen from the top to the bottom of the league of G7 leading economies in the year following the vote. On the timetable, yeah, the row of the summer, we've covered that one. He, he caved on the first day. Last June, will the UK be out of the customs union by March of this year? I would have thought so. No. Uh, Post-Brexit, a UK-German deal would include free access for their cars and industrial goods in exchange for a deal on everything else. As a member of the EU, Germany is simply unable to even do that. It was in May 2016. The stuff he doesn't understand would fill a book. So why do we still listen to him? Gary in Bedford is the president of the David Davis fan club, and he joins me on the line now. Hello. Hello, Gary. Go on. <laughs> Probably a bit of a, a headline. Uh, I, I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't call myself any 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 politician's fan club leader. No, uh, I was te I was teasing. Actually, these are these I, are, we're I, in post irony Britain now, aren't we? Post Brexit uh, Britain. Yeah, so so yeah, I was joking. But you are. Like you do think that his 
that, that we should still be consulting him despite the fact that he's been proven wrong about everything? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a generic point, really. It was sort of in the question of, uh, oh, okay. do I wake up every morning thinking, oh, I'd need to listen to, to David Davis? Uh, mm. No, not not specifically. Um, however, you know, when you, when you look at sort of our mainstream media and it's sort of open to views all over the place, no matter how... Yes, how but it's not that views, that have... is it? Is it that's, that's part of the problem, is that y y y the views are not worth the mm. same. The view that the moon is made of cheese is not the same as the view that the moon is made of moon. Well, you know, the, 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 at the end of the day, the, the guy's got his, his reasons for saying what he says, whether that's d delusionment or, or not. Um, <laughs> the not the this is the best we've got. I just checked with the producer. You are the closest we've got to someone arguing in good faith that it's worth listening to David Davis. And you've already said, well, maybe he's delusional, but... Well, well it, it, it doesn't matter what, what, it, what, it, what it is. It's, it's a case of, I mean, I'm sure you could pick on any... any I'm sure you could find many good examples of, of Remain, strong Remain MPs and, and, and find, find facts to suggest that most of what they've said over the last year is, is completely incorrect, not just on Not Brexit, over the last the year. Issue. I'd really struggle, actually. I think, obviously, the, the, the really... Uh, the toughest nut to crack, of course, is that the economic forecast before the referendum made by people like Mark Carney, they start working immediately to stop their own forecasts coming true. And then you hear David Davis on the radio this morning say, well, you can't trust the Bank of England. They've been proven wrong about all sorts of things. And you, 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 you need to make the distinction between Mark Carney saying, if I don't do anything, this will happen, and then him doing lots and lots of things to make sure it doesn't happen. But I, I don't think I would be able to construct a list of Brexit-specific statements that are so categorically incorrect that I could fill a book with them with, with anyone from the so-called Remain side. I just don't, mate. No? And I do this every day. Well, well of, of course. I, I just, I take it from the very, very simple fact that when I, when I wake up in the morning, I don't want to have a, uh, a, a very one-sided, one-message oh, well, mainstream does, but media no feeding, feeding me with big sort of propaganda, if you like, of, 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 of a narrative. It's, okay, it's, well, you're sounding a bit, I, a bit I, silly I like now, because it's not, it's not feeding you with propaganda or let David Davis say more wrong stuff, is it? I mean, the, the, the reality is, is somewhere between the two. So you can speak to somebody who recognises uh, that little nugget of honesty that Boris Johnson accidentally stumbled across six months ago when he said that the withdrawal agreement is worse than remaining. Th th those kind oh, of yeah, things. Sure. I, if you take, you, take the, you take the principle of, I mean, you know, to, to remove it from Brexit and you get, you get some, other, some, some other topic that obviously has dominated most, most of our airwaves now over the last couple of years. But take another issue and, you, and don't, I mean, of course, Radio 4, you were talking about the, the time that I had this morning, but on other issues, they've had some, some, some crazy, some crazy people on over, over the last and couple Nigel of years. Nigel Lawson on, on climate topic. change twice. And, <laughs> you, get, you get, I mean, well, you know, the, the leader of the so-called free world doesn't believe in global warming. What do you, you know, it's, it's, you, you get people on their backing, backing... No, backing I, I think in broad, in broad terms, we're probably in agreement that, that, that a diversity of position is healthy, but David Davis isn't brought in as a kind of eccentric... Uh, voice in the wilderness. He, he's brought in as the voice of the Leave campaign, and he's been wrong about everything. Well, well, so at what is, point is he, is he brought in as the official voice of the Leave campaign? Well, he is on a day like today. Voice, or is he brought in as a voice? Well, he's of the, the, the Leave only campaign. voice you'll hear if he's the only one that's been booked oh, for a program. No, no, he's not. Well, who else have no, you heard he's today? Not. He's he's. he's Oh, today, today, no. Well, I just not, said not, today, not today, mate. Yeah, I don't, I'm going to knock it on no. the head now, because I think you've set yourself a task that is impossible, although I admire your uh, commitment to the cause, and I thank you for it. it, it you, 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 can't, you can't keep listening to people who are wrong about everything. It would be like taking your car to a mechanic, going to pick it up, and finding that it's got no wheels, and being told by the mechanic that your car doesn't need wheels. You just need to believe a bit more. Or, or you know, who are you going to trust? The mechanic who's put wheels on your car or the mechanic who's got it all up here? And then he taps the side of his head. At what point are you going to stop taking your car to him? Presuming that you get it back on the road after he's removed the wheels and told you to believe in it. That, that's just the thing. I, I try and find the simplest questions to ask at the moment. And today it doesn't get much simpler than this. How wrong does this man have to be before we all start ignoring him? Milan is in uh, Rashkot in India. Milan, what would you like to say? <laughs> bit different to Chiswick. Um, it, it's it's yeah, you, is it? Thanks David. for the Twixes. <laughs> oh, oh, you got them. Oh, Again, I did get them. I didn't realise yeah. you were on your holly bobs, but, but um, where are oh, we? Yeah. Carry on. 
Um, just a brief question. Did you share them, or shall I move on? I, I did share them. Not with my colleagues. I shared them okay. with my children. My colleagues can buy their own okay, tuxes. Cool. Carry on, Milan. Uh, um, so, David, if memory serves, um, didn't he say that the Republic of Ireland was part of the UK? No, that was, well, that was, Andrew, that was Andrew Bridgen, mate. He still gets booked as well. But David Davis uh, at least has a kind of veneer of credibility, whereas uh, most people recognise that the likes of Bridgen and Francois are chiefly for comedy value. Daily Telegraph talking up Mark Francois as a leader of the Conservative Party today. I, I would join to make that happen, actually. I just but, In the interest of satire. You, I, leavers will... I think if Leavers are going to phone you today, they'll utter two words to counter the David Davis rhetoric, and that'll mm. be Ollie Robbins, because they will say that, actually, David Davis wasn't in charge. There's actually Ollie Robbins, and so he was. Uh, you're right. That David is David. one of the balloons that has that has been um, floated since the since they got they sacked Sir Ivan Rogers. Did exactly what Nick Timothy told them to do. It all went horribly wrong. So they blame it on Ollie Robbins. Ollie Robbins, the the chief negotiator's job was essentially to do the Prime Minister's bidding, and the Prime Minister's bidding was defined by Arch Lever Nick Timothy, and of course the Secretary of State for leaving the European Union and the Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson were expected to contribute to this process, but they didn't. They just sat in a corner shouting wibble and then ran for the hills the minute that it had all been written down. But you're right, they will use Ollie but, Robbins as the latest Brexit means Brexit, will of the people. If only someone else had been in charge, we'd all have our unicorns by now. Do you know, I, I wish... I wish Brexit will come on. I think the media has some sort of responsibility, like right, to have fact checkers on, independent fact checkers, and say to like likes of David Davis, Peter Bone, Jenkins, say you'll come on the show, but there's going to be an independent fact checker who's going to call you out if you come out with nonsense. It happened to one of them. That and complained. What, they did it to one of them. It might have been Bernard. I think it might have been Redwood, and he actually complained. Well, I wasn't expecting this. I need to double check that. It, it may not have been Redwood. Milan, in, enjoy your holiday. Safe journey home. He got it right once in 2002. We should not ask people to vote on a blank sheet of paper and tell them to trust us to fill in the details. Referendums need to be treated as an addition to the parliamentary process, not a substitute for it. Fast forward 14 years to June... 2016, the UK had a referendum on leaving the European Union. The results showed the country had chosen to leave by a margin of 52 to 48. Davis has not since once questioned the efficacy of referendums in determining matters of national importance. Odd that, or not. Apparently I did Milan a, a missed service and he paid us a compliment of ringing all the way from India. David Davis did pretty much claim that Ireland was part of the UK. Back in 2016, he said that the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland border was internal. An internal border. I don't think even Donald Trump has... Um, embarrassed himself that much. So, and that's the question. Eh? Just how embarrassing does David Davis have to become before everybody in my profession agrees not to listen to him anymore? And, I, and I'm looking, actually, um, Gary's best efforts notwithstanding, for somebody who actually thinks he's worth listening to. And, and as I, I, I demonstrated with Gary in Bedford a moment ago, I promise you, there's no challenge from me. Um, I just want to know why. And, and saying I, I'm interested in a diversity of opinions is a broad broadly supportable position, but, but not in the context of, of David Davis having been wrong about everything. So far, at what point does everybody turn around and say, he's very sociable apparently, so he'll be on, on drinksy terms with a lot of these people in my game, and that, that perhaps explains it, but any other line of work? You took your car to a mechanic, and they took the wheels off, told you that you'd be able to fly home? Would you take your car there a second time, let alone, as the British media is with David Davis, a 200th time? 0345 6060973 is the number to call. Strange old times. Dave's in The Hague. Um, kind of international flavour to the programme today. It's very gratifying. Dave, what would you like to say? Well, I think you're looking at it the wrong way round as to why uh, we are listening to somebody like David Davis. Yes. I think the problem is that, particularly at, the, uh, at this stage, the leading candidates for uh, leadership of the Tory party are keeping their heads down. Uh, you're right. And so uh, yeah. when the bookers are, you know, trying to get somebody for the 810 slot, yeah. they've got a lovely selection of Bridge and Davis, Duncan Smith, etc. And, and uh, well, Duncan Smith isn't a serious contender, is he? Oh, I see what you mean. So you get you get the yeah, yeah. so yeah, your your you, you, you your Johnsons and your Go Gove's been. Has anyone seen Michael Gove for, for the last few exactly. weeks? Even exactly. Boris. Someone exactly. said to me yesterday, exactly. Boris Johnson's almost invisible at them. God, that, yeah, I hate it when people make me feel stupid, but it's very good for me. You're absolutely right. I've been looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. Yeah. 
Why are we right. talking to David Davis? Because he says yes. He's got yes on his answer phone. He, he, he yeah. ring gets a phone call from the BBC or LBC. Would you be available to appear on that? Yes. Yep. I'll be there. Yeah, I'm gibbering away, talking nonsense. I'm David Davis and I've got all the answers, but I just don't understand the questions. Yeah. <laughs> what time? I've got six more minutes, mate, before Mystery Hour. What am I going to do now? You've solved everything. Well, how's your crossword coming on? Ah, uh, crosswords. <laughs> my middle. No, go on. Sorry, Dan. I fixed your crossword for you last time. You did, indeed. And I'm very grateful to you. You see, we need more callers like Dave. Solutions, you see, not problems. Answers, not more. More questions. 03456060973 is the number you need if you want to genuinely launch a, a, a kind of a kind of defence of him. I suppose there is an argument that says you should be talking to him a lot, but pointing these things out, pointing out all the things he's got wrong, pointing out all the mistakes that he's made... Um, but that's exhausting. And I tell you, I have this problem myself when it comes to why I'm not keen, although I think if there is likely to be a second referendum, I might change my policy on this and, and start appearing on the sort of programmes I normally run a mile from because the presenters don't fact-check. You're sitting on a panel and David Davis on the other side says something that's not true or, or you want to remind him of something that he said three years ago, but you're not there to in, to, to interrogate him. You're not there to question him, you're there to put forward another opinion. It's why I was unhappy with Gary's contribution. That Davis says one thing, another guest says another. The presenter treats them as being equally valid or equally valuable. If you sit there as another guest and start saying, well, hang on a minute, don't you remember when you said it was going to be the, the row of the summer or when you said that... Um, uh, con contradicted by reality is the best way of putting it. Don't you remember when you said that we'd have a trading area one and a half times the size of the actual planet? All of these things... Um, can't be pointed out by another guest without that guest looking like an insufferable prig. And I look like enough of an insufferable prig on my own without needing to go out and do it in company. 11.55 is the time. Maliki is in Belfast. Maliki, what would you like to say? How are you doing, James? You'll just listen to Bill with David Davis. I think one big supporter he has would be Arlene Foster of the DUP, who actually sat on British television last night and told everyone in Britain that um, the pre your Prime Minister was an embarrassment to go over and beg in Strasbourg for the agreement um, that, she, that she had negotiated in the end tellers. And yet the same woman today is on a plane on the way to Brussels with some MP from Westminster to beg that the, the withdrawal agreement be reopened. When we've got 27 countries saying that's not going to happen. Yeah, but this is beautiful. God, you're good. So this is this is semantics, isn't it? So if you're criticising if you're if you're criticising a, a, a an enemy politician for asking the European Union to do something that they're probably not going to do, that's called begging. But if you're describing yes. your own mission, it's suddenly called demanding. Yes. So Arlene's going there to demand that they reopen the withdrawal agreement, but Theresa May is begging them to extend the, tran uh, the, the, the Article 50 terms. And, and if it was the yeah. other way round, you know, if Theresa May employed slightly more Rottweiler-like spokespeople, they'd describe Arlene Foster begging them to reopen the withdrawal agreement after they've made it clear that they never will, while she is demanding that they give in to her request for... I mean, she wouldn't get away with it because she gets tested by reality, whereas Arlene can still peddle fantasy. 100%. And one other point... If David Davis wants a job, when the British people finally realise that he's nuts, what he could do is do what Enoch Powell did when the British people the decided Union that Union he was nuts. Yes, <laughs> he came to Northern Ireland and was voted in as uh, an MP for Westminster by the DUP. Strange times. And then you're right, there's nothing new under the sun, is it? It all comes around again eventually. Do you have any... I mean, I'd, I'd quite like to take a bit of a slap round the old chops this morning. I've been quite robust in my analysis of David Davis's public pronouncements. Can, can, can you conjure up any case for him being included in the national conversation after having been so wrong about so much for so long? I cannot believe that he was actually a minister at the negotiating table. Which is nearly frightening. leader of the Conservative Party, mate. <laughs> um, unbelievable. You know, it, it's frightening when you hear his analysis, especially about Ireland, where he has absolutely no idea and no clue, or most of the British politicians don't have, regarding this country and what Brexit is going to do for them. Um, but the fact that he's taken seriously by British actual people, I find it just incredible. And, and as you say in your show constantly, 
when you hear, you know, the, the, the shutdowns of everything they say that is on through, still, even on news night last night, and you still get these British politicians still rattling the sabre about Britain can be better off, this can be great, this is... But I, I just find the whole thing that if you have a working brain... How do you come to the analysis that these people need to be taken seriously? Well, that, 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 that is, that's my problem, is because you just use the phrase, if you have a working brain, and I've used much stronger language than that, but sometimes when I hear it being spoken back to me, I, I, and I, I, I'm lucky enough to be able to do empathy, so I kind of imagine how that would feel. You, we're calling these people brainless. We're calling them not possessors of functioning brains, and, and oddly, that makes them double down even though they might not ring me and tell me that they think David Davis is a class act, they double down on the arguments that he has made and, and that have been shown to be wrong because the alternative is to, to cough to a sort of gullibility. It's why there is no room, and I struggle personally with this, no room for hair splitting when it comes to people who are um, uh, reflecting reality, even if they do it in a disingenuous way by saying that they're bored rather than that they realised they were horribly wrong for the last 30 years. You've got to just go with it, because the alternative is for them, of course, to stay on the side of the madness.